You're listening to the God, God Life, Life Culture, Culture Podcast, Podcast, where faith and what's trending collide. Welcome, welcome back to the latest episode of the God Life Culture Podcast. This is Eddie. What's up, everyone? This is Miguel, and we are so thankful that you are tuned in to another episode of the God Life Culture Podcast. We want you to take this moment. If you have not subscribed, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can be notified when we drop a new episode. And don't forget to leave that rating, to leave that review. Like we always say, it helps put our podcast in front of more people and it expands our reach. So we are so excited once again that you are listening to this brand new episode um, and we're just excited to dive in. Eddie, how are you feeling today? Today I'm doing great dodging the pollen as best as I can with spring comes allergy season and I get those seasonal aller- allergies that just destroy me. Uh, um, so this is a time of year where your car is like covered in pollen and you know people cutting their grass brings all that up as well um, especially in this season where we're in now where people don't know if it's allergies oh, yeah. or if it's you know something else it's not nothing else <laughs> it's allergies <laughs> for but, sure uh, but yeah so it's really just that like just trying to dodge everything um so that cuz when i get my allergies i get them pr- pretty bad actually it's like if i'm actually like sick sick it's not just a sniffle it's like a full congestion gross situation that happens um so aside from dodging all of that everything is great i am blessed my family is great i have nothing to complain about has everything on your end awesome everything is going well we are winding down the school year like i said the last time so it's just you know planning for our summer uh my birthday is a little less than a month away so we're planning that and all those things trying to see what we can do now that things are a little bit more open and you know free to a certain extent. (laughs) So uh, looking forward to that as well. Um, And today we have a very special guest. We're very excited to have, um, you know, this individual with us. We have uh, known her for quite some time now. We have known of her ministry and have, you know, collaborated and worked together throughout the years on so many different things. And uh, I know each of you that are listening right now are going to be blessed by this conversation. So would you please welcome to the God Life Culture podcast, Marianne Angeli Laguna, would you please, uh, you know, welcome her? And Maria Angeli, can you please say hello to our listeners? Hello, hello, hello. God bless you, everybody that's listening uh, through this podcast. I'm so blessed to be with you guys. Yes, thank you so much for taking of your time to just have this conversation with us. And we want to give you a moment right now, uh, to, you know, to introduce yourself to all of our listeners who this may be the first time they're hearing of you and may not be familiar with your ministry. Who is Mariangeli Laguna? I am simply a servant of Jesus Christ. Um, and with that comes many different things and functions in which um, I'm at service in the kingdom of God. I am a mother of uh, five beautiful children. I know it sounds like a lot. I'm young, <laughs> but <laughs> I do have a blended family, beautiful blended family. And um, I have three boys and two girls and my husband, um, my beloved husband, Jean Laguna. I am also a worship leader. I led, I have led um, worship for, I would say more than at this point, 30 years. Yeah. And um, within that, you know, uh, worship leader and founder of the chosen international. And, uh, I also, I am an associate pastor at Manantial de Vida in New Jersey. And among all those things, you know, we serve in different areas and just, you know, we just love the Lord and love serving the kingdom of God, even through a pandemic. Yep. Uh, we just, we just love to do, um, God's will. So this, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be with you guys. Awesome. And we thank you for, you know, taking out of your time to be with us as well. You know, in your intro, you threw out a lot of things. You threw out uh, uh, a woman who is a servant uh, or who serves in her church, a worship leader, a pastor, someone who's been worshiping for over 30 years. Um, so obviously there is, you know, if you weren't born into church, you know, you definitely had, you've been in church since you were very young. So how was church life growing up for you and even like from childhood through your teens? 
<laughs> that is such an interesting question because, you know, back in the day, things were a little bit different. You know, we had to be in church. Um, I was basically born into a pastoral uh, family. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, basically you're a believer or you're a believer. You didn't have other, another <laughs> way of life. Um, you know, and uh, the way that it used to be back in the day, we had to be in church every single day. That was 24 seven. And if you weren't yeah. in church, you were fasting. If you weren't fasting, you were praying. Uh, you were taught how to, how to fast at, you know, at three, four years old. Um, it was that type of environment in which, you know, today we may say, oh, that's, you know, that wasn't so good. But um, in reality, it just really, um, uh, you know, just rooted us and um, in my family, you know, I come from a family of eight brothers and two sisters is 11 of us in total. Um, so with that, you know, there was a, it was a definitely adventurous because <laughs> at the same time we are in church, we're all in church. So mm -hmm. um, you could imagine the type of environment. I, I could say that I was, I'm so blessed to be, uh, have uh, been brought up and, and born into a household in which, you know, um, everything was the Lord and ministry. And um, we all, as, you know, as young as we were, served in different areas um, because by the grace of God, you know, um, we, we were all talented in different ways, you know, and gifted in different ways. So either yeah. you're a musician, you're a sound engineer, if you're not a sound engineer, you're a, a praise dancer, if you're a praise dancer, or you're a worship leader. We were all involved, you know, so it was 24 seven. And, um, you know, that's the type of environment I was brought up into, you know, um, within that, you know, comes uh, the whole process of being a pastor's kid, you know, yeah. um, uh, that's a whole other thing, you know, being brought <laughs> up in church, but then being a pastor's kid, the pressures back in the day, you know, coming from a more conservative environment. Um, there was added pressure, pressure yes. into it. But um, at the end of the day, we all went through our situations. But I have to give it to that process that really rooted me into becoming, you know, the becoming, mm -hmm. the journey. Um, sometimes we're so focused on the end goal and the the journey of the journey of becoming. It is the most important journey because really that's what your life is going to consist of. Because you know our, our end goal should be in a, a fulfillment. You know, it's definitely heaven. So once you're dead, you can't do nothing else. You got to do it while you're living. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of us are waiting, you know, I want God's purpose to be fulfilled. Well, God's purpose is fulfilled in your journey. You know, that's, that's a, a lesson I learned um, yeah. through, throughout my journey, because a lot of times we just expect one, one thing to be a satisfaction or one thing to be a fulfillment. But life within itself is the fulfillment of your purpose and your destination. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Miguel and I can definitely share the same, you know, experience of growing up in church, old school church as well, where mm -hmm. it was, you know, the culture was definitely a lot different than what it is now at the moment. And but, you know, those are things that we even spoke about in the last episode that we look back at with great memory because they molded us. They gave us the experience needed, you know, to be able to be a true servant of the Lord and to know how to serve and to be there for others and to also exercise the gifts that we have within ourselves to be of a blessing and to be, you know, of a, you know, in Spanish is like como un herramienta, a useful tool for God yeah. and his ministry. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but aside from that as well, we also do understand that even though we spend most of our time and most of our life and most of our energy in the church, Outside of the church, there were things that you did that were part of the process as well. So for you, life outside of the church, was it any different? Like, you know, did you find yourself um, having a more difficult time, like assimilating to like school life and every like mm -hmm. friends and all that other stuff? Or that wasn't even a situation for you? Well, for me, you know, um, it was, I, I really noticed a transition. When I was in Vieques, Puerto Rico, it wasn't as noticeable for me, you know, mm -hmm. because that's, it was like a small town. People knew, you know, oh, she's a pastor's kid. 
So basically there was no other expectation of me um, and there was no um, difference, you know, in the sense that, yes, I went to school. Yeah, I needed to have my grades up. I mean, even if I got home super late <laughs> from the service <laughs> the day before, I still had to get homework done. I still had to get the assignment done. I get how much pressure that could be, especially for a church kid, that their parents are fully involved and um, you are involved. Uh, um, I totally get that part of the spectrum, but for me, it was more noticeable when I transitioned into United States. Um, when we moved over, um, when you find the different cultures and the different people and the different um, belief um, and creed, um, that's where I began to notice, wow, how different we are from the rest of the world, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, being, me being a, a young Puerto Rican girl, I came at, um, when I was 11 years old. And, um, at that point, you know, we couldn't wear certain things, um, even to school. So I had to pretty much, <laughs> I remember in elementary school, um, playing baseball and mm -hmm. um, playing with my long <laughs> jean skirt, my long jean skirt, you know? And it was those type of little things, you know, that I realized, you know, how different um, it was here because in Puerto Rico at that time, you know, it was more, it was, it was more common, you know, for yeah. you to see more Pentecostal um, young kids, you know, just dressing the form in the way that, you know, we had to dress, but here was a completely different culture. So this, this, this country is when I began to realize how different we are. Um, and I got more, a little bit more bullied than, than, than when I was in Puerto Rico. So the outside world, you know, yes, it, it collided, you know, in mm -hmm. some ways with, with the way we were brought up and, um, there was a lot of pressure, but at the end of the day, once I passed that middle school, a tough, uh, season, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I transitioned into more like the high school high school season, um, you know, I started, you know, being more confident who I, who I was and, and um, getting to know a little bit more, you know, like seasons pass by, it will get better, you know, mm -hmm. like sometimes we're stuck in a season in which we're still, you know, trying to be comfortable with who we are, you know, especially in the Lord and, and um, you know, how we want to present ourselves to the world and everything like that, that could be a lot of pressure, especially when people have different views. And if there's such a time as this, I mean, I'm sure a lot of young kids are facing even other types of situations in which uh, you find yourself, you know, pressured against the culture, you know, yeah. um, like nowadays, if you just think a little bit different, like all of a sudden, you know, you, you could even be put to jail. Let's just put it that way. It's to that extent where we're getting into. So, um, but, you know, nevertheless, we have to begin to get to know each, you know, ourselves through Christ. And, you know, the more you know God, the more confident you become in who you are, the more, you know, your beliefs become more, your convictions and your convictions become your actions and your actions become your lifestyle. So basically nobody, you can't, Nobody can move me from who I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it gets to that point, you know. So for me, um, that point was high school in which I began to, um, you know, just accept myself a little bit more. But, yeah. you know, other challenges came with that, you know. Right. And it's funny, you know, that you mentioned high school and middle school. Uh, you know, I'm a high school teacher. And that's one thing I always tell my students when, you know, I see that they're going through a situation or, you know, it's prom season and they don't know who they're going to the prom with. They haven't been asked or it's Valentine's yeah. Day week and no one's giving them flowers or chocolates. And it's like the end of the world or, you know, someone doesn't want to be their friend. I always remind them, you know, it hurts now and it's hard now, but it does get better. And a lot of these situations that you're kind of confronting right now, it won't matter years from now when when you have that identity, when you have built your character, um, you know, yep. so these, all of these experiences definitely mold us and, and create, you know, our identity and, and build who we are. And like you said earlier, you mentioned that you were, uh, you know, you were worship leader. Um, you know, many people may know you as that powerhouse vocalist, right? Uh, you know, traveling to different churches, singing, uh, you've put out music, you've, you know, you have, we are the founder of the Chosen International and, you know, did many projects and um, events with with them as well. And now you're in a different stage uh, within ministry where, like you said earlier, you're an associate pastor at your church, Spring of Life. 
you know, worship leader and worshiping and being out is completely different than being an associate pastor at a church, you know? So how has this, how has (laughs) this new role of leadership changed your outlook and perspective on ministry? Well, you know, I believe that in every stage, God prepares you for the next, Um, you know, so never underestimate the value of the process. Um, Sometimes, you know, we don't like to go through specific situations. We don't like to go through failures. We don't like to go through uh, process situations in our lives. But that is precisely, you know, the the failure that you think that that's going to be the end of the world. That is actually your stepping stone and and for you to step into the next phase of your life. You know, the Lord will test us. Our faith will be tested um, through different trials. But it's really building a foundation in which we, you know, is creating a strong foundation in which we can continue to build upon. So sometimes we run away from the process, you know, but at the end of the day, the process is what's building that foundation in order for you to uh, build from there, you know? So I believe that, you know, God was already preparing me through a series of uh, process, you know, because one of the biggest things that I always, if I'm able to share with any worship leader, any, any person that maybe foresees me as a mentor, um, every beginner worship leader, musician, minister that I've been able to mentor in any level, the biggest thing that takeaway and lesson that I have learned is that you cannot pretend to go touring or go to different churches without having a household church in which you are planted in, in which you are held accountable. And that's one of the things that, you know, some ministers run away from. They just want to go here. They want to go there. They want, you know, to walk through every open door. They don't want to be held accountable. And one of the biggest things that I believe that um, my parents at that time that they were my pastors that they really laid on me was, was, was a, the, one of the biggest lessons as a minister is that you have to have a church in which you are rooted in. You cannot just go um, here, go there and not have, you know, someone that will correct you, that will guide you, that you will be held accountable to, because if not, then you're just, you're just going to be a hopping person that goes from one place to the other. But the moment that the storm comes, you're not rooted enough to withhold the storm and to with, withstand time. Many people have told me, wow, I cannot believe how many years, you know, you have just kept um, either with the chosen or just kept doing ministry and kept faithful. And one of the biggest uh, keys and key points that I can give to anyone in ministry is that the biggest thing that has allowed me to be persistent and to persevere and to continue to be in the correct path is the fact that I was I was planted and I was rooted uh, in my local church And even though I got many opportunities to either, you know, station myself somewhere else or I got offers here, be a worship pastor here, um, you know, mega churches trying to reel me in, I knew where God called me, okay, with a purpose for me to grow. God knows exactly where you need to be in order for you to grow. Um, because, you know, you could go to another place in which you get offered in um, or you, you will get a salary. But is that really the place in which gonna, it's going to propel you to the internal growth that you need in order to withstand and the, the, the test of time, basically? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's why you see people that they come and go. You see that they explode in ministry. Wow. God opened doors. God did this. But the next second, you know, something happens and all of a sudden you don't hear from them no more. And the reason why is because a lot of these people were not dating. They were not ever held accountable. They were never rooted or planted in a church. So how did God prepare me in this transition? The, the same way I'm telling you. I was rooted. I stayed where God called me. Even if I got um, called or open doors. I got calls here or there for me to, you know, do this, do that, get ahead of myself, you know, be a worship pastor with, with a salary and, and all these things that may look so good, but I denied them because I knew where God had called me. And that's one of the things you need to know where you are and where you're headed. And, um, yeah. 
And I believe that, you know, this, this, this didn't happen overnight. Basically, um, many people might have heard, you know, oh, yeah, she's getting, oh, my gosh, she's getting installed as a social pastor. But I had many years in which I had been working in my local church, not just, you know, traveling out there, but also sewing into my local church. I was working actively in my local church. I was building in my local church. So within that, when God, you know, sees the passion, and when God, um, you know, sees that you are planted in spite of the process, you know, he will, he will in his due time fulfill everything he had spoken. Because one of the biggest things that I always ran away from, and, and I think it's like, you know, the biggest ultimate calling is pastoring. Right. And, right. Um, and, and that was one of the things that I always ran away from, you know, le- listen, you could, you could tell me, um, evan- evangelist, prophetess, worship leader, psalmist, you can- <laughs> every <laughs> other name. But please, you know, pastoring was such a, a thing that I ran away from because I saw my parents um, the way that, you know, all the, all the process that they had to endure, the rejection, the betrayal, um, just a different process. You know, people coming, people going, the pain going through that. Um, the transitions, you know, the changes, it's, it's never easy, you know, to have to see your, your parents maybe cry out at night because, you know, they're enduring such a hard situation, you know, because every church go through seasons, you know, there's seasons where it's like springtime, everything is flourishing, but then there are seasons in the churches where it's wintertime, you know, where everything is cold and rigid, you know, and, um, yeah. and you have, and you have people that come and go, you know, and, and, right. and pastors endure that process process pastors hurt through that process you know they're human beings you know so um so within that you know when when god calls you for his ultimate calling he he doesn't call you out of just the blue you know he calls you because he's preparing you along the way so that's why i say the process and the journey is as important you have to remain faithful you know even when things are not looking up even when things uh, you know, um, I remember there was a point in my life and I have testified about this, no secret, you know, when I was younger, oh my God, I wanted to flee <laughs> from my church, from my local church, you know, because, you know, it was one of those things where you felt, you know, you were appreciated outside of your premises, but in your own, you know, local church, like, like the Bible says, there's no profit in their, their place, you know, um, it, it was very tough, you know, um, to, to endure specific pro- process, but I needed to mature. I needed to grow into the person that God wanted me to, to grow into. And, right. you know, the next chapter will require more growth. So we never stop growing basically. But when God called me into pastoring, it was a thing in which um, without the title, I was already working. I was already being faithful. You know, some people wait for the title in order to do. And some people are just doing without the title. And then God just merges, you know, both things together and puts them together in his time, you know? Right. And I think and, that's and, so important because I yeah. think so many people, they, they want that position or title. They want that role. And this could even apply to things in our everyday, you know, life, whether it's, a, you know, at a job, we want a higher position or we want, you know, to get promoted, but we don't, we don't do what needs to be done. Right. We don't act the part or, or mm-hmm. do what's required. Um, you know, and we, kind of want that prize without putting in the work, you know? So I think definitely in ministry, like you said, there is, you know, work that's done that no one sees and may never see, right? No one may ever see all the work that you put in to behind the scenes for years. You know what I mean? Sewing into your church and sewing into different people and maybe feeling, you know, unappreciated and feeling like you weren't valued. But, you know, ultimately we have to trust that God sees those things and God, God, God is watching, you know what I mean? And when that right time comes, you know, his plan and purpose will be fulfilled. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned uh, is working closely with your family within ministry. You know, this is something, you know, I'm a pastor's kid, um, you know, for a very long time. And this is something that, you know, ministry has been a big part of my life, right? And, um, you know, in all families, right, especially when you work in ministry very closely, you know, like you, you have brothers and sisters and what was it? There's 11 of you total. Yep, they eleven, 11 total, of us. Right, that's a lot of people, <laughs> right? To yes, you know maybe have disagreements or things on right, but 
you know, especially when it comes to family time and ministry, right? So I'm talking about a regular random barbecue you guys have or a birthday party, right? How do you find that healthy balance when it comes to time with your family and then, you know, time with ministry. So for instance, you know, you're at a birthday party, you know, how is it that all of you, you know, your parents are the pastors, your sister's a worship leader, your brother's a musician. How do you kind of refrain from bringing in ministry into this family gathering? Well, the thing about it is that, you know, um, we have to remember you know, um, there is who you are and then there is, you know, your function. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, there is a job to be done and then there is, you know, um, who you are. You are a first and foremost a, a daughter or a son of the king, you know. So that relationship with Christ cannot be, you know, um, como uno dice descuidado, you know. You right, can't right. be careless, careless mm -hmm. with it. And so that's number one. And number two, you know, you have to remember that God has entrusted you with your family. And um, so, so understanding that, that, you know, I am a wife, I am a, I'm a, I'm a mom, you know, um, it's definitely, it, it precedes before any type of ministry um, that I'm, I'm able to do because the first ministry that I have is my family. So in reality, I am working ministry as I work my interpersonal relationships. Um, it's just that I have to remember that that is my priority, you know? Right. Um, and, and, and I think my parent, my parents were really good with this in the sense that even though, yes, we were in church 24 seven, because back in the day, that's the way, you know, it was, it was the way, the only thing they knew how to, how to work it out. But at the end of the day, I do remember two to three times a year, my parents used to take two weeks, you know, three weeks and, and take us on a whole field trip through um, the island of Puerto Rico. So I do remember that. I do remember weekends. Every weekend we went to the beach. You know, I remember we had to leave early um, because if not, hermanito, he would show up, you know. Or <laughs> so we made sure we packed up before <laughs> the hermanito and the hermanita would show up, you know, because, you know, some people, they, they just think, you know, you're 24 7 to them. <laughs> right. So sometimes you gotta, you know, how to do it, plan yourself, you know, accordingly, schedule yourself accordingly and plan ahead, you know, so you don't have these little surprises here and there, you know what I mean? Um, sometimes like for me, the balance is, you know, I turn off my phone. I, I really, you'll see me, I'll disappear from all, cause now, you know, it's just more social media that could really get to you like hours upon hours, just being there scrolling and scrolling. So what I do is I, I like, let's say if I had a busy, busy weekend, you would be, rarely find me on Mondays unless I have, you know, a live transmission, which I usually have on Mondays, but you know, like once a month or something like that, that I am in charge. But if I'm not in charge of the transmission, listen, I'm turning off my phone. This is family time. This is where, you know, I have, you know, um, this moment with my family and so forth, you know, because maybe for some people days off are weekend, but maybe for pastors, weekends are the busiest, you know, right. um, this is where we're working the most. So maybe throughout a weekday, that's the only time I'm going to have to spend time with, with my family. So yes, I don't say yes to every single invitation, especially now that I have family. I don't say yes to every opportunity that comes because um, an opportunity could become a tarnishment when it comes to your family. If you're constantly busy when you don't have time for your family, then you lose the most important part of, mm -hmm. of ministry in which God gave you. So I've always been very careful with that, um, especially with, with my, my family, my kids. They're definitely my priority. Like, it doesn't matter how big the event is, if thousands of people, if it's going to really tarnish um, my scheduling um, or my time with my family, there are things that I, I'm just not going to be able to do. You know, um, yeah. and, and I have to be okay with that because I'm building upon my legacy. That's my priority. Yes. Yeah. And That's I agree my priority. With that. You know, we, yeah. we've spoken about that many times on this podcast as well, where, you know, it was, I think a couple of episodes ago, we were speaking about the idea of taking a break 
like you know mm-hmm. like going on a sabbatical for example you know yeah i shared in one of my more recent episodes that you know my wife gave birth to our second child last year and mm-hmm. i took a break i was like all right this position in church i mean i mean whatever here's i have a sub that can fill in for me this is what you got to do I have to take time <laughs> you know, to be with the family and which in a lot of places is unheard of, but it's like you said, your family is your first ministry and Absolutely. You know, that's the first thing that God gives you. So you can't descuidar or um, be careless with that, but then want to take care of other things. You know, those are things that God is going to call us accountable for. And, you know, one of the great things that I, you know, from hearing from your story and hearing about your family is how a lot of those experiences are experiences that God allowed to happen to fortify you in ministry and mm-hmm. in any family, whether you have a 10 or 11 brothers and sisters, or if you have just one or two, you know, conflict, it's something that arises, especially mm-hmm. in, um, whether it is inside the church, outside of the church or whatever, when it's a, it's a generational gap as well. You know, you're trying to create a church event, you know, the youngins have an idea, they want to do it this way. Maybe the older ones want to do it a certain way or whatever. Um, so <laughs> how have you guys, you know, when it comes to conflict resolution, what are tips right. other people that not only applies to, you know, family life, but also in ministry? All right, so this this is an interesting topic because um, you have to remember since I rem- I, I started um, ministry super young, you know I transitioned along the way, and mm-hmm. um, you know my 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 church culture back in the day was completely different. You know um, we will start up the service con coro de fuego. Let's just start. <laughs> let's just start through there. Yeah, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But like yeah. I, you know, I I used to say. I was in that type of environment, which, you know, um, you know, like their praise and worship was not there yet. It has not, it had not arrived in my church culture because we were predominantly, predominantly from Puerto Rico. So it was more like, uh, you know, the salsa, the, the merengue, the more upbeat um, type of thing. And I was already getting invited in opportunities to go to other churches and seeing all the things. I was seeing gospel, I was seeing praise and worship. I was seeing many different things and I'm trying to introduce this into my church. Let's just start through there. That was just the beginning point for me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and as a worship leader, it was a breaking through um, cultures that were very rooted, you know, and I had to break through all that. That's the reason why I felt, you know, at some point, like, uh, I'm hitting a dead end, a dead end, like a wall because, you know, it was very, very tough, but I had to be persistent in what was important, like choose my battles, you know, at a time. Like, you know, sometimes as young people, we want to be able to conquer it all. And, you know, these, these are the type of transitions that unless, you know, you come into a point where you're a pastor, you realize Every change is a transitional point and is very tough on many different people. So you have to bring things um, slowly but surely and one thing at a time. Because if you make too many changes in a church at a time and abruptly, that could also do more damage than any good. You know, yes. and and that's you know, and that's where as the youngins, as you would say, you know, <laughs> for us sometimes it's a little frustrating. You ra- we rather go to the next more modern or upbeat church because you know it's just too much work. But what if God chose you to be the one to bring the change in your church? What if God was the one that called you to um, have those new ideas in which you could implement and just ask God for the time and the opportunity and the wisdom to be able to bring them up so he could bring uh, forth uh, a a change into your church culture. I literally had to um, be exposed to other things that I knew that were beneficial and that we needed to you know, progressively moving to if we wanted to have any youth left, <laughs> if we wanted to have, you know, the next generation come in and really stay and yeah. retain them. So that was the toughest thing for me because I was a youth pastor for, for many years. And um, I wanted to bring, you know, uh, coffee houses. I wanted to bring concerts. Imagine we started with The Chosen, which was a Christian rock band. And you're talking about a super duper conservative mm-hmm. environment. I, I, imagine the way I was 
looked at back in the day. You know, it was a very rough, it was a very rough um, time, but I persisted and I stayed through the process and I was able to see that there was changes little by little to a point in which, you know, it started with the worship and then it, it transitioned into something else. And then we were more open to certain things. And when you come about it, you know, it, it's, it's like the becoming of it. Wow, I'm part of this. It would have been easier for me to go somewhere else where they were already there. But how beautiful it is for you as a young person to be used in your local church to really bring forth, um, uh, you know, a more progressive and, and not saying progressive Christian as to, oh, yeah, we're open to sin. No, 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 no. I'm right, talking right. about, I'm talking about, you know, ideas and strategies. You know, it's, it is the same gospel we're preaching. It's just different strategies mm -hmm. in which we have to use. Like back in the day, they didn't have Facebook. They, they didn't have Facebook Live. They didn't have to stream through YouTube or through, you know, all these things. Imagine if we would have been old school and, and really behind the media back in, you know, a year ago with the pandemic. We wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to transcend into, you know, people to watch services online, you know. So it's to that point what, that I'm speaking of that I know for I know that um, it caught a lot of churches by surprise because they weren't ready. They were still stuck in the old way, you know, and where they wouldn't even record um, or live stream um, services. So if you didn't go ahead with the times, this is the type of thing I'm talking about, um, you know, you would have really been way stuck behind and people would have been hindered, you know, just with their Bibles trying to survive through this pandemic and have their own little services at home with their own little pandereta, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> So it's to that point that I'm speaking of. Yes, times are changing and they're changing rapidly. And we have to move in um, within the times, you know, to strategize. Yes. The Bible and the word is still the same, but we have to. So basically what I'm trying to say is that you have to be patient, you know, because mm -hmm. not everybody was, you know, has the same ideas at the same time that you have them. So you have to first ask God for direction. If this is something you, you know, you should be even battling with, with at this moment, mm -hmm. you know, or if what are the priorities, you know, and yeah. um, if you really feel moved that this is something important, because listen, like for us, um, it's been, you know, um, we had a lot of kids that didn't understand um, English. So when my brother, which is my, my senior pastor, Pastor Luis Alberto came in, he implemented, um, you know, uh, we have to do services bilingual now mm -hmm. because now we have too many kids and too many young adults that do not understand Spanish. So we came from a fully Hispanic church to now a bilingual church. And mm -hmm. we progressively, because we made that move, now we're getting all different type of cultures into, yeah. into, um, into the church. So it is to that point. And eventually, you know, there might be a fully Spanish and fully English because that's where we're headed. See, yes. these are changes little by little that we've had to make according to the demand when you see the demand you have to supply it and and that's that's where it's at you know prioritizing on on the actual demands you know not so much what we want but the demands that are at the now moment you know yeah yeah absolutely and i think you know the biggest takeaway from all of that as well is the idea of understanding timing god's timing and having the patience to go through the process, you know, Absolutely. a lot of us, you know, we see something, we want to change it. And the idea may be great. The idea is fan fantastic. But if the timing is not aligned with God's timing, like you said before, it may do more damage than actual good, you know, and that's something that you apply in church mm -hmm. ministry you imply in your own personal life, always being sensitive to the voice of God and having the patience and the trust to know that, all right, God, you're going to lead me and you're going to, you know, give me the sign or you're going to give me the opportunity when to bring this forward. But in the meantime, allow me to hold on to you, Lord, because I really, you know, I'm stressed out or, you know, I really want things to change or whatever the situation is, uh, depending on the scenario. And on the topic of patience, you know, one of the things that we like to speak about with our guests that are married is, you know, to get a little insight on their love story to see, you know, because there are a lot of young people who find themselves, you know, wanting to have their significant other and, you know, God still hasn't showed them who it is or confirmed their relationship or whatever uh, their situation is. And a lot of times when sharing our own personal experiences with finding 
our one, you know, we, we bring encouragement to them um, to know what to look for, out for and also to understand that God's timing, like I said earlier, is, you know, perfect. So you bring up your husband, Gene, Mr. Gene Laguna. So is there uh-huh. anything from your relationship marriage that is a lesson that you think is worth sharing with our listeners? <laughs> I laugh because my husband, um, he was in front of my face the entire time. He was in the church for 10 years before we actually looked at each other in, in really? some type of way. Absolutely. Sometimes you're looking everywhere and it's right in front of you. And um, that's one of the give- takeaways that I, I, I could, I, some, sometimes we're so consumed in seeking, you know, who's going to be the one, who's going to be the one, who's going to be the one, instead of becoming the future wife or the future husband that God wants you to be. Sometimes God is just waiting simply on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just what it is. Is there, he's just waiting on you. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you have to understand that everything, his time is perfect because, you know, if I was to meet my husband in the beginning of those 10 years, I wouldn't be able to retain the glory. I wouldn't be able to retain the promise because I was either mature. I was, my mind frame was in another way. You know, um, I, I had yet not become the wife of Jean Laguna, um, that I needed to become in my mind, in my perspectives, in, you know, the way I think, um, you know, and, 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 and sometimes God is simply waiting on us. So in the meantime of waiting, you have to realize that you have to start, you know, get to, to, to get to work. Don't ever think that you're just ready. If it's not there yet, it's because there's still work on you that you need to do. There's still, um, space that you need to give. Maybe you with somebody that's not it. And Mm -hmm. you're not allowing, you know, for God to, to move and to work in your behalf because you're putting your hand in there. And, um, I believe that, you know, we could either delay God's prosper, you know, the, the promise. Um, it's there. It's not that God is not faithful. God always wants to fulfill his part of the covenant, but he's waiting on our side, you know, of the covenant. And, um, I believe that, you know, um, when you marry somebody, you don't marry them for your convenience. You marry them for purpose. You know, um, you don't just marry to uh, multiply, you marry to build a legacy. See, there's just, it's different perspectives, you know. Um, you don't just marry for the wedding day, you marry for the marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's just different things that you have to look into in, 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 in which, you know, when, when we're young, we look things a certain, certain specific way. We think that El Principe Azul is going to come and the Prince Charming is going to come and, oh my God, and my big wedding day and everybody's going to be there. And um, we start thinking of like these illusions and we forget about the reality realities of it because we don't know yet so so this is the only thing we base ourselves on you know when we're in that conquest but what the lord is is, is showed me throughout my process was you know um that at the end of the day you know you don't need to look for that prince charming that prince charming will come to you the person that god has for you you just got to really in reality you know get closer to god work on yourself and i know that's hard listen um i'm not saying that if you see a cute guy or you know a, a pretty girl that you're not gonna look at her and you know be attracted but you know when it comes to surrendering your heart you know and you give it to somebody else that is not part of the pl- god's plans what you're doing is basically wasting your time and there are people that persist on relationships that are not for them you know when god is is getting ready to give you what he needs what he you know what what is for you you know but you still persisting on your own will and unfortunately you know some people stay on that they stay on that permissive will they don't they don't wait to see what god has for them and the big takeaway is you know you literally have to wait on the lord waiting on the lord doesn't mean that you're not going to like you know be human and have friendships and getting to know people but when it comes to surrendering your heart and in giving your time to somebody it's either an investment or waste of time. So that's the one thing that you have to, you know, you have to be looking into. Am I wasting my time or am I investing my time in somebody that's actually worth it, that I believe that we could build a purpose and that we could build a legacy, 
you know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, I knew immediately after so many heartbreaks and failures, I knew immediately the moment I spoke to my husband, I knew that he was going to be my husband. I don't know how to explain it to you, but I just knew it was the conversation. The immediate conversation that was driven was, I'm not looking into something. I really just like talking to you about Christ. We began to talk about godly things. We began to talk about our past experiences. And we realized, wow, it's like God brought us for such a time as this, you know? And, and you just know. You just know from when you know that that's the person that God has for you. Because you've gone through all of these situations in which you put yourself in. And then you realize, wow, you were right in front of me. That he was, he might. My husband um, is my brother's best friend. Wow. So basically that there you got it. And like, <laughs> you know, and he was there for 10 years. He would go to my concerts. He would support. He would buy my merch, everything. He would even, um, you know, give donations, you know, and not eat. You know, we didn't look at each other like that. He was just the other hermanito from the church. He <laughs> sat all the way in the back, all the way in the back of the church. And I sat all the way in the front of the church. So it wasn't even like we were looking at each other like that. But God was already working. God was already dealing with both of us. So you got to know that as you're going through your process, God is also giving time to your future spouse to get ready. Yeah. And, you know, you might feel like you're ready, but maybe your spouse still needs to get ready or still ha needs time to get ready. And we got to give space to God in order to do that let's not yeah. get ahead of ourselves you know and listen go to the salidas and and have fun <laughs> as a young person it's so true. <laughs> like enjoy your youth i did that i married mm -hmm. when i was 30 years old and people thought i was gonna stay hamona and you know <laughs> and i got i got all the pressure in the world because my sisters got married when i was they were younger one of my sisters had a double wedding i was just started through there one was 19 years old and the other one was 21 years old and they married super young they married in a double wedding and um and that was that so i was the last girl from all of my brothers and my sisters i was the last girl to marry and, and that's not um, even obviously speaking that's not even speaking about the fact that you are always out in different places right and i think a lot of times when people um, you know, see ministers or worship leaders, right? And they begin to like, you know, they're attracted to the calling. And I think, you know, they, they gravitate towards that. So it's not even to say that probably, you know, there was no one interested or looking, right, in your direction. It was just the sense of it wasn't, you know, who God had for you, right? And kind listen, of like you said, that process of waiting. Listen, sometimes that's the biggest problem. You have too yeah. many people looking into you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is the biggest problem because it's a big distraction, you know? Um, so, so you just have to be discerning and you have to be, have self-control too because not every person that, you know, tries to speak in your ear means that that's a person that's really interested in who you are. And, you right, know, there's right. many people that are just into your anointing. Yeah. But, you know, do you really like me, you know, when I'm not having such a good day? I, you know, do you care more about what I do than who I am? And that was one of the things that with my husband, he was so used to seeing me in church. He really didn't think of me as a big deal, um, which I love. That was such a, a like fresh air because he wouldn't even ask me of ministerial things. He was more interested in me. What do you like? You know, que te gusta comer? <laughs> right, right. You know, um, and he cooks. He cooks really good too. So these are things and he's a hard worker, you know. And that's the thing, like, you know, a lot of times we're looking into the behind the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the calling, and we don't realize, you know, we need a, a we need a husband that, you know, is a hardworking, that is a good father, that is a responsible man, that will be a faithful man. Like, what's, what's it worth for me to, you know, just like you under the anointing, but outside the anointing, you know, you, tu eres mujeriego, you know, and, and that's, that's those are the sort of things that you have to look into you know yeah. um who they are you know in their relationship with christ like my husband you know he didn't have so much of like a, a ministry at that time you know the lord's been building him up but he didn't have like you know all these things that he he has now we're building together you know and and but one thing that he had was the ingredients you know and that's the thing you got to look into the ingredients it's, our song. You gotta look into the <laughs> it's so true and, and i know that there are so many listeners listening that you know can can relate to what you're talking about you know and you know not only are you a wife right but you're also a mother 
And, um, you know, what has being a mother uh, taught you about your relationship with God? Ay, ay, ay. That he is, and he has such unconditional love. He's, he loves us so much. He persists so much. <clears throat> Going through the different situations, you know, my pregnancies, both of my pregnancies were very complicated. And um, it just, you know, allowed me to understand a little bit of, you know, the sacrifice he made on the cross because, you know, I literally, you know, had very risky um, pregnancies with both of my kids. And I was holding on to those pregnancies, like, for my life, you know. And once I had them in my arms and I gave birth to them, one, I gave birth naturally, and the other one, you know, had a C-section, and I had to... Uh, they took a tumor out of me, of my right ovary. And um, it was like a whole tumor, you know, I had a, a whole process, um, you know, just with both of them. And um, I understood like once you have them in your arms and you bring life, it makes all that pain, you know, just worth it, you know. And I believe that that's what Jesus felt for us, you know. Like he says, you know, I was crushed and I was wounded for your peace, you know, but, you know, seeing you with peace, seeing you with life, seeing you with salvation, it makes this sacrifice all worth it. And I believe that that's what God, you know, shows us as mothers, you know, um, that in spite of the pain, in spite of the process, you know, to be able to have, you know, give life, um, it does not matter even if it costs death, you know, even if it costs pain, even if it costs, you know, um, sleepless nights, you know, um, and, and I believe that that's what you learn, that just that love, that profound love, you know, that comes with the process and with the experience and just, you know, seeing my children grow and just love them unconditionally. They're both different. They both have different temperaments, you know, different mm-hmm. needs. And, you know, you just try to provide as much as you can. And I believe that's what God, God knows our needs. God knows our temperaments. God is not afraid of our our tantrums, you know, God is not afraid. Um, it also taught me like, oh my God, so many spiritual like nuggets because um, I had one of my babies, you know, that um, for all those mothers that breastfeed and stuff like that, um, you know, I had one of my, my kids that, you know, they just wouldn't launch on, you know, and, and I'm like, man, I got milk that I have to get, I, that I could provide for you, you know, that could give you all the nutrients that you need. But, you know, he would just refuse, refuse and God would give me nuggets. And like, you know, this is the same way that I want to give you, you know, I want to give people the nutrients and the milk and the food that they need and they reject it, you know? And then, you know, then I have my other child that, you know, he, he launches on and he, he loves, you know, the feeding and, you know, it's just lessons, you know, us as sheep and, and God's children, you know, how sometimes God wants to provide for us the nutrients and, and, you know, he has everything we need, but, you know, we refuse it, we reject it, you know, and it's just different lessons like that, that you get when you have children. It's, it's a whole other level. It's a whole other level. I love being a mother and I thank God for that honor. Yeah, it's it's definitely an honor. It's a blessing. You know, even as a father, it's something that, you know, it just completely changes you. You think you know how to love. You think you know what patience is. You think you know what forgiveness is. But once you have kids, <laughs> it like oh, completely yeah. pushes that uh, into a completely different level that does give you a better understanding, you know, of God's love for us as well. You know, we can continue talking and talking and talking of, you know, all the great things and our experiences with God. Uh, But we do have a final question that we did want to ask you. Um, And it's, you know, you you speak about, you you mentioned something earlier about church culture, you know, and, you know, nosotros somos el cuerpo de Cristo. And as someone who has done a lot of traveling as well, um, you know, you haven't only gone to Spanish Pentecostal churches. You've been everywhere, you know, across Mm -hmm. the United States, across the globe, and all that other stuff, you know, where do you see the church culture moving towards now in the future? I believe that the church culture is going to have to supersede um, the world culture. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say this is because a lot of times we are confusing, and I mean as a body, no, Mm -hmm. Um, as a whole, sometimes we confuse uh, the world culture with um, the church culture, you know, and, and in order for us to understand deeply what the church culture is, we have to really look upon the word of God. What was the real purpose of it? You know, 
um, what was what was God's purpose for the church, you know? And when we look back in the day um, and we look in, upon the Bible, um, we see that through crushing and through persecution and through, um, you know, the church stood their grounds no matter what came their way, you know? And now we're living in a world in which, you know, everything is a cancel church um, culture, Mm -hmm. Um, basically if you go against the ideals of, you know, whomever, whomever is the current, whatever is the current, whatever is, you know, um, the, the thoughts and the mind frame, whether it be politically government, whether it be, um, you know, just religious wise, educational, you're going to see that there's going to be so many forces in this time that they're going to call themselves, you know, the woke culture, the cancel culture, the, you know, the progressive culture, you know, so many different things. And we have to understand that our culture should be based upon the structures that we're giving the biblical, you know, in the Bible. Um, th that doesn't change. That doesn't vary. I don't care the times. I don't care, you know, estamos en el 2021. No, no, no. The word of God does not change. And um, there are bi biblical principles in which we as a generation have to stand up and stand upon in spite of the culture. You know, what, what are we going to do the day that they tell us, okay, yeah, you could go anywhere else, but you can't congregate, you know, um, you could, everything else is open, but the churches, you know, like they're going to shut down or we don't want you to speak this message in the streets. We don't want you to evangelize. What are we going to do? See, we can, we have to understand that <clears throat> our culture, our God culture, culture, as we would say, you know, we, it, it, it will bring friction into a world that, you know, we see that evil is up and rising, that there is a, there's spirits that have been released for such a time as this. Remember, we have to locate ourselves where we're at, you know, the coming of Jesus Christ versus the church, the end times, where are we at, you know, located. And um, we have to understand that as the times progress, there's going to be um, higher pressures for the church. You see what I'm saying? So we have to be a, a, a united front. And when I say united front is that we cannot allow these little things that divide this church from that church and da 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 This can no longer reign within our spectrum. We have to be a united front. And, um, you know, and speak when we need to speak about the important issues, the important things, because just, there's just a higher amount of battle that we're um, going against. You know, there's a current, like there's a big current, okay, that's coming forth against the church. And what are we going to do? We cannot allow sin. We cannot allow this because you do have, you know, um, churches that they're call themselves the progressive in the modern church where they're allowing all types of things, you know, they're allowing sin to come in, you know, now they say, Oh, it's okay to do this. Oh, it's okay to live this lifestyle, you know? And, and, and we have to understand that our culture cannot be affected by the currents of this world. We have to bring friction. We have to affect the culture of the world or the culture around us, you know? And the only way that we bring that forth, obviously we strategize, but at the end of the day, even if with strategy that is not accepted, we still have to do what we have to do because we have our own identity and our identity and our culture identity is not based on this world identity. And that's the one thing we have to understand. Like something, some people think, oh, we have to become like them in order for them to come. No, 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 no. We don't become like that. We have to understand that we have our own identity and that we more than anything um, have to base ourselves on the biblical truth. And that is a culture we should build upon. You see what I'm saying? Yes, that we could strategize. Yes, online, we could do this, we could do that, da, 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 da. You see what I'm saying? To reach the people, like what, what you guys are doing, you're doing a podcast, you're reaching the people. But at the end of the day, you cannot change your message as you're doing it. Because right. there's a lot of people that are confused because, you know, the churches are trying to be so progressive that they forget the biblical truth. And now they're becoming like the current. You know what I'm saying? They're becoming like the culture of this world. And we cannot become like them. 
You know, we cannot be so consumed in politics that we forget about the gospel. We cannot be so consumed in, 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 in the sinful, you know, progressive way or, oh, you know, we don't want to offend because, you know, we are in an offended type of culture right. where you offend me. So now I cancel you. You offend me. So now I can imprison you. Um, you offend me. We have to understand where we are in the climate of the world and the climate of the atmosphere. You know, there's social injustice, there's this, there's that. So we have to be able to make a balance between being relatable, but not becoming like them. You see what I'm saying to you? There are issues that they're going to go left, they're going to go right, they're going to, you know, people are going to think this way, people, but how do we bring them together to the God culture? We have to always bring Christ among everything that we do. Yeah. We, I mean, we cannot... This- you know, we cannot bring Christ out, out of, out of, out of the culture. And unfortunately, right. a lot of churches are just doing that. They're just focusing on social, social justice, but they're not focusing on the balance that brings all together. Because if we're trying to bring just, just one, one type of tema, right? Social mm-hmm. justice. If we're just bringing one specific thing, oh, you know, you can't preach about this. You can't preach about that. So we're going to, you know, give a wishy-washy type of message. Then at the end of the day, I will really bring in forth the, the, the God culture. Um, so we have to just be careful. We don't fall into those cracks in which we, became, we become so complacent that we're no longer holy as yeah. our, cur- our, our culture. So we just have to make sure that our culture is built upon um, you know, the God culture, which is a structure of the biblical truth. And we cannot stray away from that no matter what strategies or what modern thing you're doing, technological wise, reaching out to people, doing this, doing that. Make sure that you always um, stand up in your standards, no matter what it costs. Yeah. So that's that's my advice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this podcast is called the God Life Culture Podcast. And I think you hit all the points of what we're trying to say. The idea of, you know, God impacting our life, God impacting our culture. And how does God do that? God uses us, right? God mm-hmm. uses the church to do that. So, um, you know, everything you said was awesome and definitely, uh, you know, an encouragement to everyone listening as well. Um, you know, like Eddie said, we could be here all day talking, but, you know, we are going to wrap this up, but we first want you to uh, share your socials. Where can people find you on social media? Where can they find your music and everything that you are doing? All right. So um, right now, my social media, the most that I use is Facebook. Um, you could find me there, Maria Angeli, the chosen girl. Laguna, I always put the chosen girl because I used to be the thing that would people <laughs> recognize me. I'll probably change it soon, but most likely you'll find me. <laughs> you'll, most likely you'll find me as Maria Angeli Laguna now. Um, also, my musical would be the Chosen International, both in Facebook and Instagram. And you know, I am in all the different things, but I'm not as active. So those are the ones that I promote the most. I am a missions director, MDV Missions. So you could find us also in MDV Missions if you ever want to see us minister through the Word. And, um, basically just keep me in prayers. You know, I want to work on my third musical project and I'm praying for God for all, to put all the resources that I need together in order to release this because definitely it will impact this culture. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> so go out there and stream, you know, um, all yeah. the songs from the chosen international go find, uh, you know, her on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube as well. Um, her mm-hmm. church also spring of life church, Manantial de Vida. Uh, you know, I know you will be blessed by everything that they do. That's one thing. Every time your church goes live, it's on my feed. And, you know, I see the different things that you guys do and even just the missions, um, you know, activities and things that you all do. It's, it's very encouraging to see that there are churches and ministries out there that, you know, are doing what they have to do, right. And have their priorities, Mm -hmm. um, where their priorities need to be. So we just want to thank you so much for, uh, you know, being with us today and, uh, you know, taking of your time to speak to us. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a great pleasure and God bless you guys for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you so much. So we just want to say thank you again to Maria Angeli for being on um, our podcast today. And we want to shout out to all of our listeners who have subscribed, who are leaving their reviews and ratings. We want to thank you so much for doing that. If you have not subscribed, be sure to subscribe so you can be notified when we drop a new episode. Follow us on Instagram and on Facebook at God Life Culture 
podcast. So once again, we want to thank Pastor Maria Angeli Laguna for being with us. As always, we encourage our listeners to support our guests. So that means like if they have music like she does with The Chosen International, to go ahead and do that, support, buy, purchase, stream, view, do all of that good stuff. And, you know, if you like the stuff that she said and you want to listen to her even further, you can find her stuff on YouTube. You can follow her on Facebook as well. So we want to thank you guys for taking your time to listen to the latest episode of the God Life Culture podcast. That's God Life Culture. Until next time. See ya. Bye.